1 Peter chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Oh, stop there for a second. Now, these verses, obviously dealing in verses 1, 2, and 3 with the spiritual growth of a newborn Christian, or a Christian that's been saved for a while, but haven't matured. Well, what do we need to do in order to mature? We need to lay aside all malice, guile, hypocrisy, envies, and evil speakings. Okay, now notice, it doesn't say that those things will be taken from us. We must lay them aside. Just as we choose to put on the whole armor of God, we have to choose to take off the armor of the flesh. The armor of the flesh contains malice, guile, hypocrisy, envies, evil speakings. Right, I mean, James tells us that, you know, behold the tongue, such a little member can set the entire body aflame just like the rudder of a boat or a great ship can turn such a great thing even though it's so small. Right? Why do you think evil speakings, malice, guile, hypocrisy, envies, all those manifest eventually in the tongue. Right? We have to lay off the old man. He'll make us into a new creature if we allow him to. Okay, But we're not going to teach on that this morning. Verse number two. Once we set those things aside, then as newborn babes, Desiring the sincere milk of the word, we can continue to grow by that milk. And then that milk will turn into spiritual Gerber, baby food, right? Get you on some solids. And then eventually, Brother Brian, some T bone steak on down the line. Right? But it is growth. Right? I should always know more today than I did yesterday about the things of God, about the word of God, about my relationship with God. I should be stronger in the faith today than I was yesterday. Because of one word in that verse, desire. If I've laid off the old man, I will desire the things that feed the new man, which are the things of God, the Word of God, Amen. fellowship with the people of God, communion with the Spirit of God, prayer to God, which we heard about on Wednesday night. We will desire those things because... They will make the part of us that we desire most strongest. And that's the part of us that is associated with God. Then verse number three. Why do we have that desire? Because if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. As the psalmist said, taste and see that the Lord is good. What does that desire for the things of God, where does that come from? Why does that manifest? It? Because we have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And you can get a taste of a lot of things in the world, you will not find the taste of grace. Why can we not find grace? We may find forgiveness. We may find long-suffering. We may find temperance. You know, maybe even meekness in the world. But grace is, by definition, not giving us what, is, you know, what we deserve. All right, no, I'm sorry, that's mercy. Grace is just bountiful riches bountiful riches that you had no claim to that you had no right to just because somebody cares deeply about you now you may find mercy in the world there's a lot of people that won't do to you what you deserve and hallelujah for that but really grace what does the world have that they can give you something that will ensnare you entrap you, blind you, keep you in darkness even if they try to be gracious they're doing you harm if they do it solely in the flesh. Because the arm of flesh will fail you, and all the works that you do in the arm of the flesh will fail you. But see, grace, really, study it out. We can try to be gracious to others, Brother Brian, but what are we really giving them as children of God? What God has already given us. We're just sharing the grace that God showed us. Really, the only thing good, only thing pure, only thing holy. What is that? That's God. So truly, grace unmerited, unearned, unclaimed riches 
I mean, the Bible says that God is no respecter. If somebody else could go out and accrue money, I could if I put in the work that they did. Right? It rains on the just and the unjust. So if the world has it to give away, that means that I could have earned it. But God's not interested in earning it. People out there don't want what, well, some of them do want what you've earned. But they desire the same things that you desire. They have the same ability to give you what you can give them. That's not grace. That's just moving pawns around in a checkbook. If you've tasted, if you've seen that the Lord is gracious, you really understand what grace is. And that really only grace can come from God or the things of God or the people of God that are giving the things of God to others. You really, that really clicks up here, you'll have a desire for the things of God. Not just for yourself, but so that you can give to others. Because if you've tasted that, well, that's grace. I want other people to know about that grace. Because that's the real stuff. All right, but let's continue, or else we're never going to get finished. Well, referring to the Lord, in verse number 4, to whom, coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up in spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Well, what do those two verses mean? Well, he's the foundation and we're built on him. And because he's alive, he's made us alive. Amen. What those verses mean? Then verse number six, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, meaning God's had this plan all along. And God said and promised, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Well, not only are we built on him and made alive like him, what does verse number 6 tell us? We'll not be confounded. We won't have a lack of understanding concerning how God took a little virgin maid who found you know, grace in the eyes of God, that she was richly blessed because she was going to be the vessel that would bring birth to, or give birth to, the Son of God. Well, where was that birth at? Well, he was born in Bethlehem. He lived in Nazareth. And he took some place. I mean, they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In the place you'd least expect, in the manner that nobody else could do. He didn't send the Son of God in full glory because everybody's faces would have melted off and the world would have, you know, ceased to exist because the world has now been cursed by sin just like man's been cursed by sin. And if he showed up the way that he really is, there wouldn't be anything left. He didn't come in the way that people would expect or that people may think that they deserve. Well, God's vindictive and God doesn't. That's not what this book says. Never take an unspiritual person's opinion on spiritual things. Because they're going to get it right. And I didn't say lost people's but unspiritual. There's a bunch of saved people that aren't spiritual. They're going to give you bad advice. But I know the one that's the living stone, and he's made me a lively stone. And I know that his foundation is sure. And even in the most peculiar places, in the most peculiar circumstances, what did God say he would do in verse 6? Behold, I lay inside a chief cornerstone, elect precious. Well, what's elect mean? Best of the best. What's precious mean? Very valuable. And then after that, it goes on to say, And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Well, confounded not only means, I mean, you can, if you're like me and you hate math, Miss Crystal's not in energy back in Dead Zone School Room, we could say that. If you hate math, there are some math problems that are going to confound you, right? I got confused when they started putting regular letters from the alphabet into math. There are some that they throw Greek letters in to the math problems, and they don't get it. Nope. It confounds me. I can stare at it all day long. I'm not going to crack it. Right? Well, we've also heard the expression, you know, you're going to look at it like a new calf looks at a new, or a calf looks at a new gate. That calf is confounded. Doesn't know what to do with what's in front of it. Well, those that are built upon Christ will never in their life reach a situation where they have no idea where to turn next. If you've seen that the Lord is gracious, if you have that desire for the word of God for the things of God for fellowship with God himself you may get to a situation where in the flesh you say well I don't know what to do but in the spirit you say well I'm built on the rock it's not a dead rock 
This is the chief cornerstone. The best of the best. He's alive, just like I'm alive, because he's made me alive through him. He's placed me on himself. So I may not know how this is going to end up, but I'm just going to keep doing what God wants me to do. I'm going to get in here and find out what God wants me to do. Until God says do, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not confounded. I may not have the answer, but I'm not confused about it. I'm not going to be standing, you know, standing there staring at it with my mouth open, tongue hanging out saying, uh, I, I don't get it. No, I'm going to be busy about the Father's business until he tells me what I need to do about it. Won't be confounded. Okay, but twice already we have read verse number four referring to Christ he was chosen of God and precious verse number six that that chief cornerstone was elect and precious verse number seven unto you therefore which believe he is precious three times in seven verses we find that phrase or that word precious talking about Jesus so with the Lord's help, we're going to teach this morning on how precious is Jesus to you. Now, as I was reading these verses, started thinking, what makes something precious? Well, what is precious first? Highly valued. Something that is dear to you. Something that you just don't leave laying around, but you safeguard it. You take care of it. You may even secure it somewhere. So that just in case something doesn't happen to it. Because I don't know what tomorrow holds, but they make fireproof safes. And I've got one in the floor of my closet to where a lot of ammunition is stored so that in the event of a fire, if it doesn't burn the whole house down, I don't get shot in the foot while trying to put out the fire. Okay? But then also, there are a lot of paper documents in there. I've done some wills for people around the church. Guess where those are? In the fireproof safe. Because they're worth safeguarding. Okay, well, all of that being said, if Christ is precious to you, you will spiritually do those same things. You'll safeguard them. You won't leave them out to where it can be tarnished. Your relationship with Him can become, you know, dusty. God forbid, moldy. Right? Or, if you're like me and something isn't important anymore, but it may one day become important again, you've just got an area in my case, there's a lot of them where you just throw things and you know it's there. You don't know where it is in there, but it's over there. Right? That could be the garage. It could be the shed. It could be a drawer. You know, I was always, I thought everybody had a junk drawer because as a kid, I'd ask dad for something. And he'd go, I don't know, go check in the junk drawer. Right? To this day, he has a junk drawer on his dresser. What's in there? Things that are important enough not to throw away, but that it's taking up space right now. Right, got to get it out of the way somewhere. Right, and then one day I found out that underneath of his credenza downstairs, that was a big junk drawer. But Christian's not in his head. He knows that's true. Well, what, what do we say? Some things are precious to us, and other things are just barely valuable enough to hang on to. I don't know how I'm going to need this, but I might need it one day. Well, that's how some people view Christ. That's how some people use, view church. Well, as I'm studying this out, what makes something precious to us? Right? Whether worldly standards, whether biblical standards, what is it about something that is precious? What makes it to where it's valuable to us? Well, first off, there's quality. You could take something that other people may have access to, and you can make it the best, better than anybody else, and then it will become precious. I mean, to this day, they say that the best watches come from Switzerland. Why? Because they make them the best. They have perfected the way of putting watches together. That's why if it's got Swiss made stamped on your watch somewhere, it's going to cost a whole lot more than one that wasn't Swiss made. They found out that it's, you know, hey, we can say that it's got Swiss parts in it, but we'll just assemble those parts over here in the U.S. And then we can say that it's like a Swiss movement, even though it wasn't a Swiss. There's a whole bunch of ways to try and add value to something and make it precious. But how do you do it? Quality. Right? If you want, and one, if you've got a whole lot of money, but you want something that's made out of silver or fine metal, go to Tiffany's, Cartier. Right? What are those places? High dollar places where you know they're 
quality. They do it the best. They've got that reputation. Well, isn't Christ, doesn't he have the best quality? I mean, it's not about, you can have two things made out of gold, but you can have one made really well, and you can have one that's not made really well. But does it still have value? Yeah, because it's made out of gold, but it's not as valuable as this one. It's not as precious as this. That's ugly. This one, on the other hand, beautiful. It's artwork. Belongs in a museum. Well, isn't Christ precious based off of his quality? As the Shunammite maid said about, you know, so, uh, King Solomon, that he was altogether lovely. Every way that you look at Christ, you see there's quality there. Even though, we've heard it preached on recently, that Christ didn't look like the most handsome guy in town. Right? You wouldn't look at him and think that there's anything, but yet we hear, never a man spoke like Jesus. That everything he did, people saw, there's something different. But even the Roman centurion that crucified him said, surely this was the Son of God. Why? Because everything he did was quality. Everything he does today, quality. His ways are above our ways and God does all things well. What's that mean? The best quality. His word, refined. It's silver and refined. Seven times, purified. Why? For quality. So that his people would know that these are the very words of God that God intended for them to have. Everything about him. Quality. Top of the line. When you go to eat somewhere, don't you look at reviews? I mean, I do. Unless you know I've been eating there before. Then maybe I'm afraid to look at the reviews because I don't want them to ruin one of my favorite restaurants. But that's why they invented those five-star restaurant rating systems. There are criteria to get one of them. And then there's the really big ones. They're called, like, I think Michelin stars or something. And if you've got one of them, you're big time. You can charge real high dollar. Well, the thing about Christ is he's the best quality of anything you can ever have, yet he's free. Amen. Yet he's approachable. Amen. He doesn't have somebody waiting at the door to say, well, do you have a reservation? Right. No, he's the living stone, and he's made me alive, and he's placed me on himself. I've got direct access. That's quality. When he made me into a new creature, that new creature is quality, even though I'm not in the flesh. One of these days I will be, because I'll be like him. That new body that's waiting on me, quality. Made better than anything else that anyone or anything else could ever do. Because he created it all. So he's precious that way. But then, also, what makes something valuable? Rarity. We've already talked about, well, you can have two of the same thing, but one made well, one not made well. Well, then there's rarity. Why are diamonds more valuable than other things? Because they're more rare. Why is gold more valuable than silver? Because there's a whole lot more silver out there than there is a gold. Right? If there's a shortage somewhere of a food product, what happens to the price of that food? It skyrockets because it's rarer. There's not as much of it. So if you want it, you've got to pay more. Well, he's the only begotten son of God. The only one. That's rare. But as the son of God, he's part of the Trinity. What's that make him? The creator. There's only one. That's rare. Ask Brother Tommy. He'll be able to tell you. You know how much some people pay for stupid one-of-a-kind, or what they call one-off pieces of memorabilia? Why? Because it's rare. They may not even like it. They're just buying it as an investment. Well, anybody, we've already seen, tasted and seen that the Lord is gracious. He's rare. And when you figure that out, he should be precious to you. Who is the boss man compared to the God of heaven? Why would I interrupt a conversation with God for anybody else? Why would I give time to anything else than the only one that desires to have a relationship with me? There's only one president of the United States and his schedule's booked. Would you cancel if the president invited you to go to the White House? Would you cancel if even the governor of Kentucky said, hey, I want to have a conversation with you? Yet the Lord always calling, and how many people cancel on him? Because he's not precious. They don't desire him. 
But yet, he's the rarest of 10,000 to my soul, as the songwriter said. But if he's that rare to you, if you appreciate that, then you'll fellowship with him. You'll desire him. But then, thirdly, what makes something precious? Well, we've dealt with quality. We've dealt with rarity. But also there's nostalgia. There are things that have no real value to anybody else. I mean, that's what verse 7 goes on to talk about. Unto us that have believed he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. What's that mean? If you don't accept Christ, you're not going to understand the things of God. These things are spiritually discerned. Something that you may value may have no value to me. I mean, it may be a teddy bear that's missing an eye and it's got stuff and pouring out of the side of it and all that. But to you, you see that as your very first stuffed animal. Something that you've had your entire life, that you've passed down to your kids, and that you plan on fixing up so that maybe some grandkids can use it. Right? Sentimental value. Right? Nostalgia. Most of y'all didn't like the music in the 80s when it came out, but now it's like, oh, I remember those days, and then now you like that music. What is it? That's nostalgia. Right, well, we can remove all the rarity and all the quality of Christ. But if we look back at what Christ has done for us, is he not precious? Has he ever done anything to us, for us, or with us that wasn't good? Because taste and see that the Lord is good. He does all things well. Go back and look. What has he done that now, looking back 2020 on the other side, because, you know, vision's always 2020 on the other side. Hindsight. But if you turn around and look, yep, that was good. That was meant for my good, but I messed it up. Good, 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 good. And when we turn around and look and say, you know what? He's never let me down once. I've never called and he never answered. Unless I had enmity in my life between me and him, in which case that's not his fault, that's my fault. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God won't hear my prayers. But if I'm right with him, because I desire him, and because I desire him, I live right, which is what the first verses we were talking about dealt with. When I called, he answered. If he didn't answer, he gave me that peace that passed all understanding. He gave me assurance. I've got a blessed hope that come what may, from a sentimentality standard, he's the most important thing in my life. He's the most reliable thing in my life. The most powerful thing in my life. Smartest thing in my life. Dearest friend that I could ever have. Well, when it comes to the sentimentality, He's precious. You want to know why people that just get saved usually are the most excited? Because they understand everything's great. You know why Brother Phil acts the way that Brother Phil does? Because he hasn't gotten over the fact that, man, this is good stuff. He hasn't gotten over the fact that, hey, this is better than anything else I've ever had in my life. What's that? Well, if it's going back a long time, nostalgia, if it's short, it's sentiment. He's dear to us because we understand that nobody treats us like he does. So why would we turn anywhere else? Why would we desire anything else? When everything that we do for him, what are we? We've been made a royal priesthood according to the verses. We, we have been appointed to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I get to serve the very high God. That should be precious to me. Not just because of what he's done for me, but because he's worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. Those things that we read in the Bible that we shouted or sang or praised around the throne of God are being done right now around the throne of God. We can choose to do that. I can do that now. Of course. 
Because all of my sentiment goes towards him. Because he deserves it. Because he's always been there. All right, well, next. What makes something precious? Well, it can be quality made. It can be rare. It can be sentimental. Or something can be valuable simply because you value it. Right, well, bear with me here for a second. Y'all ever hear of a tire company named Goodyear? You know how that company started? That company started because a long, long time ago, there was this tree. And the tree had a defense mechanism against insects and everything, because that's the way that God made it. And what it had is it would excrete what we would call gum, G-U-M. Well, what was it? It was a type of rubber. All right, well, this guy with the last name of Goodyear found it, scraped a whole bunch of it off, started experiment on it, and then he came up with this thing called stabilized rubber, I think it was. And what was that? Well, he left some of it on the stove for too long, and then after it cooked in the sun for a little bit, and out in the wild, or after it cooked in the heat of the oven for a little bit, it wasn't as gummy, it was rubber. It was firm, held its shape. You can make all kinds of things out of it. Most of it's it's on the bottom of your shoe. Everybody's car out there has some of it on there. Right, well, he looked at it and he said, you know what, I think I could do something with that. He saw value in it. He said, there's things that that can do. And if you think it's valuable, what does that mean? It has practical use. If something is precious, there's a reason to have it. Right? Why is China precious? Well, because of the quality and the rare and everything. But I don't care how valuable it is. I don't care how rare it is. You can take me to a museum and I'm going to say, that painting is of nothing. It's a whole bunch of swirls. There's nothing there. Somebody else may see value. I don't. Amen. I've got to have practicality out of it. I don't know if you know this. I don't have visitors. Nobody's coming over to my place. Say, hey, look at that on the wall. No. If it's hanging on my wall, it's because I want to look at it. Because I find some value in it. Right? Well, what good would China be if you couldn't eat off of it? What good would silverware be if it was really made out of silver if you couldn't eat with it? That's why they don't make forks out of 24 karat gold because it's real easy to bend and you could probably bite right through it. Have, have a fun visit to the ER that night. Uh, well, it's one thing to have, some, but it's got to be usable. It's got to be able to p be put up on display. If something's so fragile that you've got to keep it hidden in the dark in like a temperature-controlled room, nobody's ever going to see it, then what's the use in it? Why even have it in the first place? Yeah, well, just like Goodyear saw that tree gum and thought, mm, there might be something there. Right, how much more can we say of the Lord? He is very practical. Said he said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and his burden is light. Why did he tell us to put his yoke? Because he understands, I can't pull my own load on my own. He is pulling most of that load for me. Without him, not only would I not have any air to breathe, not only would my heart stop beating, because by him and through him do all things consist. Amen. But also, I can't live the life that he's called me to live without him. Because the life that he's called me to live is one of righteousness and holiness, and on my own, I have none. Amen. That's why it was imputed unto us. That's a, I'm sorry, that's a doctrinal word. But imputed or given to on purpose even though we didn't deserve it or couldn't merit it whereas the Bible says he became the propitiation for us he became the payment that was required and necessary for me to receive holiness and righteousness on his behalf in order for God to bless us the way that he wants to bless us he had to get that thing that separated us from him out of the way is what all that means. Well, why did he want to get that out of the way? Because not only did he love us enough to save us, he loves us enough to try and give us a life 
that is more abundant. Well, how do we do that? Through the practicality of living through Christ. Well, not really. Let's reverse that. We're living with the help of Christ, but really, what does Paul say? Well, I die out so that Christ liveth in me. It's more practical for Christ to take the reins of my life. Well, some people say, well, it's not convenient. It's better. Wouldn't you strive a little bit? Put on a little effort for something that's better? I mean, people pay an inordinate amount of money to get better seats at football games because they're better. But see, they see value in football. They don't see value in putting effort into living for Christ. They don't consider him precious because they don't understand, well, when he really does take control, my life gets better. It's practical. You can't go to the museum and say, hey, I'd like to hang that up at my house. They're not going to let you do that. Because to them, it's most practical that people come there and see the thing. And they get feet in the door. Because they know people want to look at that stuff. I don't, but some people do. Uh, well, there are museums that I do enjoy going to. What are in there? Things that I want to go see. Well, Christ is far more than just an ex exhibition. A piece in a museum that's locked away. No, 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 no. He wants to indwell me through the person of the Holy Spirit. He wants to walk with me and talk with me. He's not just something that we put on the shelf or put behind that bulletproof glass that's got all them sensors in there and measure the air to make sure that the quality's right and all that. Well, if they take such good care of goofy paintings because they think they're precious, why wouldn't I take care of my relationship with Christ so that practically I live a life for God that's acceptable. It's what Paul called our reasonable service, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Well, why is it reasonable? Because he's precious. Why wouldn't we? We'll wrap up this way. Sister Dawn, two weeks ago, asked me to go judge middle school speech and debate tournament. And because of that, I got roped into judging a high school speech and debate tournament yesterday. No, I'm kidding. It was over at Cooper. It wasn't that far. But I judged the final round of impromptu. That's my old best event outside of debate. And what was that event? Well, you get seven minutes to prep it and give it. And usually it's off of a quotation that they give you. Or in the final round, an object. And there's two things you can do with an object. You can talk about the thing that's right in front of you, or you can try to get an angle on it and say, all right, nobody else is going to think of this. That's what I'm going to talk about. Well, they brought in the object for the final round, and they let the judges see it first. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, I know what I'd do. You know what it was? It was one of them beanie babies with a little heart tie sticker on the side of it. And it was a turkey, because of course it is. It's almost Thanksgiving. Guess how many people talked about Thanksgiving? Five out of six. Why? Right, because they didn't see what I was, I told the ju the other judges for the round. I'm like, all right. I asked, what would you do? And would you, you know what all three of us said? Collectibles. Because people used to collect Beanie Babies. After the round, it dawned on us. You know what? These kids are so young that people don't know what Beanie Babies are anymore. Right? Well, that Beanie Baby collectible, right, I remember back in the day, they put out catalogs of, if you have this one, it's worth this much money. If you have that one, it's worth this much money. Right, same thing goes for tops, baseball cards. Why are tops more valuable than any of the other baseball cards? Because it's associated with quality. It's associated with, you know, the best, or one of the longest running for the quality that they used in their printing and in the card stock and everything else. Well, people know about collecting. And people will invest in things because there's value to them. But see, just like those kids didn't know about Beanie Babies, why didn't they know? Because nobody's ever mentioned it to them. Because it stopped being in the front of people's minds, in the forefront of their consciousness. Right for a long time, but Tommy, from about 19, 
89 until oh, the early late 90s early 2000s Star Wars faded out of people's consciousness and then they brought out three movies that weren't as good as the first three and then it faded away again and then now they're making new ones and TV shows and everything else right, well, it always ebbs and flows with certain things but see those kids didn't know about Beanie Babies they probably still don't because I didn't tell them about the Beanie Baby but they just opened it up and they saw turkey didn't make sense to them they were confounded it had the tag right on it it was still attached too so I mean if they throw that thing into a vault somewhere it might be worth something someday Right, it, was, it was right there in front of I'm saying it, it's a T.Y. Beanie Baby that's what it is it's not a turkey it's a Beanie Baby that happens to be a turkey I just wanted one person to talk about Beanie Babies nobody did it because they didn't know well how is the world supposed to know about the value or how precious Christ is if those that know about it don't go and tell them just like them kids didn't know about the beanie baby if I'd have sat them all down which I wouldn't have done because I didn't want to explain all this to them but I could have said there's a whole speech there about how that thing's collectible it doesn't matter that it's Thanksgiving right now and I had to hear five times about the first Thanksgiving one kid actually did it funny though and he says well you know how all the history books say that it happened it didn't happen that way <laughs> I was like yeah that's true but everybody knows about the turkey everybody knows about church everybody knows about going to worship but they don't know the one that's precious behind it the most precious thing about that turkey wasn't the fact that it was a turkey it was the sticker that was attached to it because if you lose that little heart shaped sticker those things are worth like half as much now you got to have the right tag it's still got to be attached all those people saw the turkey everybody sees the church building everybody sees the church member but they don't know about the tag that makes us different from the rest of them there's a whole bunch of stuffed turkeys not okay stuffed animal turkeys there will be a bunch of stuffed turkeys here in a little bit but there's a whole bunch of stuffed animal turkeys around stores all over the place but if you tried to sell them to a beanie baby collector nope doesn't have the right tag wasn't made by the right company doesn't have the right stamps on it to show that it's original well see those that are collectors the people that got we know about these things we know what to look for but how is the world going to know hey don't waste your time with that one that one's going to fall apart it was made in China and it probably made it for like a nickel right like everything that you can win as prizes at Kings Island right it's not worth it you could go out and buy a whole big box of all them things for the amount of money you're going to waste shooting three pointers on smaller rims from further distances right well how's the world supposed to know that's a counterfeit don't do that that's not precious that's junk don't buy here's one for you you know how many toys champ has torn up because they got them at the 99 cent store I mean it'll it'll last for a week and then he's going to tear a leg off and then a nose off and then an eyeball off and everything else sometimes he eats them that's not good because then he gets sick <laughs> but not quality that's not precious well, how's the world supposed to know that Jesus is precious unless those that see the value that aren't confounded at the things of God go out and tell them here's what God did for me here's why he's precious to me and here's the thing it won't stick and they won't believe it if we haven't laid aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking because then they're going to say that's a hypocrite they don't live to back it up but if Christ liveth in me why don't you do that because Jesus is too precious to me I don't want to lose my relationship with Jesus well why don't you do this over here or go and see these people or do that because it'd get in the way between me and Jesus well this person goes and does well it may not get between them and Jesus I don't know about them that's between them and God all I know is that would get me get between me and Jesus well why is that so important because he's precious he's the fairest thing in my life he's so fair in fact 
that I want to spend all of eternity with them. And I don't care how long the line is, because I know it's going to be long. It's a, Revelation tells us, you know, it's a number that no man can number. But whenever it is my time to one on one bow at his feet and worship him, I'm going to soak it up. Because one, I know a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. It doesn't matter. We're all going to get it. But just to see him. Just to hear his actual audible voice. I know what it sounds like when he speaks to me in the spirit. Or that song that Sister Renee sings. When we get there and we got the smell of God around us. That should be precious to us. We should desire it. Not because of the smell or the sight or being there, but because of the one that we get to see that's associated with all those things. Where the faith shall be made sight. The desire comes from valuing those things deep down there. So how precious is Jesus to you? Well, the world can tell by the way you live. You can tell by the way you talk, by the way you walk. God sees it in your heart because the man looketh on the outward appearance. God looketh on the heart. Well, how precious Jesus is to you is how much you'll do for him, how much you'll spend with him, how long you're willing to dedicate time just for you and him. Some don't even think he's precious and can manage to come to the house of God at least once a week. They come out of obligation. Well, how much more would we do if we really sat, sat down, took stock, said, Lord, forgive me for not seeing it before, but you're a whole lot more precious than I ever knew. And with our feeble minds, we can't comprehend exactly how precious he is. But this is how precious he is. He was chosen of God. He was the elect. The maker of all, not just heaven and earth, of everything that is said, that's the best. So you can take God's word on it. You can cash that check at the bank. What's it say? He's the best. Amen. And if the best really sinks in and becomes precious, you'll desire and you'll feast and then you'll fellowship. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on daily devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.